Good afternoon, CHP listeners all over the world. Laszlo Montgomery here, bringing you another China History Podcast episode. Now, some of you saw the episode title in your podcast feed of Ida Khan and Mary Stone, and we're probably thinking, hmm, Laszlo's talking about Ashkenazi Jews again. But Ida Khan and Mary Stone, they were both Chinese, born in Jiujiang, Jiangxi Province, in 1873. And their Chinese names were Kang Cheng and Shi Mei Yu. Though both of them are hardly remembered today, in their day, first few decades of the 20th century, they were very well known and quite celebrated, both in China and here in America. The president of China once made a marriage proposal to Ida. They were like a lot of figures from Chinese history, whose stars once shined so bright, only to fade and get lost over the years. I was working on the final episode in that recent History of Guangzhou series, and I was reading John Pomfret's fantastic book, The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, and stumbled onto Ida and Mary's story. And after stopping everything I was doing, I began digging a little and thought, what a great topic. Two women who did what they did? How can I resist? So this is the story of Kang Cheng and Shi Mei Yu. If no one has any violent objections, I'll refer to both of them throughout this episode by their English and Chinese names. This is a story that mostly takes place in Jiangxi province, a place that doesn't enjoy the cachet or prestige as some of the better-known coastal provinces like Shandong, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, Fujian, and Guangdong. Even the four largest cities of Jiangxi, the provincial capital Nanchang, Pingxiang, Jiujiang, and Ganzhou, I'm sure for many of you, doesn't ring a bell. You can maybe call this an episode about two mostly obscure women from a not terribly well-known province. Doesn't sound very promising, but after doing this for more than 12 years, these are usually the best CHP episodes. If you like missionary stories, this one may be of particular interest. It begins with a woman named Gertrude Howe, who went to China in 1872. This was during the reign of the Qing Emperor Tongzhi. His mom was the Empress Dowager Cixi. When Gertrude Howe arrived in China, three decades had passed since the first unequal treaty had been signed in Nanjing. Thanks to all the collective challenges plaguing China with the foreigners, the aftermath of the Taiping and Nian rebellions and other regional uprisings, not to mention a good share of the annual state revenue going to pay off indemnities. You could say it was a very hard scrabble time in China. In 1861, following the forced agreements ending the Second Opium War, the city of Zhejiang became one of the so-called treaty ports. Jiangxi, being an inland province and all, meant Zhejiang wasn't on the China coast. But it was located on the south bank of the Yangtze, which means it had access to the East China Sea and all the inland markets that could be served by this longest river in China. It wasn't only a port of trade, it was also a city where a great many missionaries had gravitated to. And one of the organizations that had a significant presence there was the WFMS, the Women's Foreign Missionary Society. They were under the Methodist Episcopal Church, and Gertrude Howe was part of this church. What was interesting about Gertrude Howe was that she stood apart from the WFMS faithful and her readiness to drop all pretenses of quiet racism and looking down on the Chinese in a way that Foreign missionaries have been accused of in many accounts of the history of those times. She had grown up in a Quaker family, daughter of strict abolitionists, and moved to Ypsilanti, Michigan when she was four and grew up in that state. At the age of 23, she received her call, joined the Methodist Episcopal Church, and was welcomed into the newly established WFMS, wishing to be part of their mission to establish schools, clinics, and hospitals run by women for women. This noble objective proved to be a challenge because in the 1870s, after all that had happened since the Opium Wars, there was already a sizable groundswell of anti-Western, anti-imperialism emotions, and frankly, the masses of people neither liked them nor trusted them. And for many, 
Christianity and the missionaries, it was kind of a poster for the whole dynamic of cultural imperialism that so many found distasteful. This was a common theme that kept playing out in the story. It was always an uphill struggle for Gertrude Howe and others in missionary work to gain that trust and acceptance of those they sought to save. In addition to this cultural imperialism albatross around their neck, there was also the belief across a wide swath of traditional Chinese society that eh, women's place was more aligned with how Mengzi's mother believed it should be, subservient to men. After opening up the prestigious, in its day, Rullison Fish Memorial School in Jiujiang, Gertrude did something totally outrageous for the times. She adopted a number of Chinese children. And one of the children she adopted was named in Chinese, Ai De, the surname Kang. Kang Ai De, Gertrude renamed her Ida Khan. Ida worked well as a transliteration of her Chinese name. Plus, Gertrude could honor her recently deceased sister, Ida. That worked out well. And later on, Ida herself will change her Chinese name from Kang Ai De to Kang Cheng. She had been the sixth girl born to parents who, after five times unlucky, were pining for a son. Options were explored about how to get rid of this unwanted baby girl, including the unthinkable. But thankfully for all around, she ended up being adopted by Gertrude. This whole thing, missionaries adopting Chinese children... Well, not only didn't it happen too often, it was very much frowned upon by your fellow Methodist Episcopal Church missionaries. And the local people weren't so cool with this idea either. As far as her daughters were concerned, Gertrude hoped they would all one day do the right thing, become educated, and marry a good Christian Chinese man. The more prominent, the better. Mary Stone, sure may you... She came to Gertrude in a different way. She was the daughter of the first Chinese Methodist pastor in Zhejiang, and I believe all of Jiangxi. He played an important role in the missionary movement as not only a preacher, but as an English teacher to other aspiring Chinese missionaries. Along with his wife, they ran day schools for local children. You could call both of them pillars of the Zhejiang missionary movement. They had high hopes and aspirations for Shi Mei Yu and hoped she would grow up a good Chinese Christian and be trained in providing Western health and medical services to the local women of the city. This was how they got together with Gertrude Howe. And they saw what she was doing with the Women's Foreign Missionary Society, and they allowed Gertrude to adopt Mei Yu. Her surname, Shi, also translated to the word stone. And Mei Yu, eh, not too different from Mary. So that's how she became Mary Stone. Binding girls' feet eh, was still a thing in the 1870s. Gertrude spared her adopted daughters from this custom. It didn't get banned in China until 1912, so growing up in Zhejiang society with unbound feet was considered rather unconventional and much diminished a girl's marriage prospects. Missionaries and other Western people often found this custom extremely barbaric and was often pointed to in the popular discourse as a sign of Chinese inferiority to Western people. So the WFMS, their raison d'etre was to bring Western education, medicine, science, and hygiene to women and girls in China. Besides the core preaching of Christianity and Bible studies, their mission was to go out and deliver access to Western medical care to Chinese women. Easier said than done in a place where all women had been doing things in a certain kind of way for more than a couple thousand years. So it was an uphill struggle, but it did get easier as more people saw and heard about the benefits. For many, where traditional Chinese medicine failed, there weren't many options to obtain other forms of treatment. For women, this problem was exacerbated a hundredfold because for them to be treated by a male doctor was more or less out of the question. People just didn't do it. And so, women had to deal with their illnesses themselves, and for many, that often didn't end well. So Gertrude Howe and her Chinese daughters, despite all the Christian fellowship and the smiles, they had to put up with the disdain their colleagues had for their rather unconventional arrangement. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but this was a reality she faced. 
Occasionally, sparks flew between Gertrude and the WFMS leadership. And later on, when Ida and Mary serve as missionaries of the WFMS, they too were not at all happy with the way they were treated. In 1883... Gertrude took Ida and Mary to Chongqing to serve at another WFMS mission where she helped establish both an orphanage and boarding school, and they remained there till 1886. Beginning in 1885, the resistance to the missionaries and the work they were carrying out in Chongqing started to ramp up more. Many missionaries were attacked by the local people, and Gertrude was forced to flee Chongqing and return to Jiujiang. This kind of thing happened time and again in the treaty ports and wherever foreign missionaries went in China. While many 19th century Chinese embraced Jesus, most did not. And wherever there were hard feelings about this matter, eh, sometimes things got out of hand. So Gertrude Howe, she was one of those indomitable souls that refused to be beaten down no matter the magnitude of the hardship. And though in some ways she was Snubbed by her own fellow missionaries and the very society that employed her, she was good at what she did, and everybody knew it. She was also a very good mother to her children. So in 1892, Gertrude, Ida, and Mary, they're all back in Zhejiang, and here is where Gertrude gets the idea to enroll her two girls in medical school in the U.S. So in that year, they all sailed to the U.S.A. That's no big deal now. Chinese traveling to America. But 10 years into the period of Chinese exclusion, it was a big deal. And an unwed white mother with two Chinese girls in tow ensured they'd all get the third degree passing through Angel Island. This, of course, was fully expected, and everyone at the Methodist Episcopal Church knew with a high degree of certainty this whole thing was going to create a stir. So great care was taken to ensure all their papers were in order and that They included documents from very highly esteemed members of the Methodist Church that could be proffered for inspection, and they got through okay. So Gertrude Howe was from the Wolverine State, the great state of Michigan. After saving up enough for tuition, she was able to get Ida and Mary into the University of Michigan's med school. Back then, and still today, one of the top-rated med schools in the country. They adapted quite well because they had two major things going for them. First, they were already completely fluent in English, and thanks to growing up in Gertrude's household, quite familiar with American customs. And second, they were both very devout Christians and remained so until their dying day. And that counted for something back then. Though Ida and Mary surely had to look the other way at occasional flourishes of racism, They were both very popular with their classmates. I've played this matter down so far in this story, but in all the work Ida Khan and Mary Stone would do over the next several decades, they never wavered in their love of Jesus and their religion, and both of them were certain that Christianity could save China. In fact, they believed that the main reason Western countries were so rich and powerful relative to China back then was because they were Christian nations. Well, they received their MDs at the University of Michigan in 1896, the first Asian women to do so, and among the first Chinese women to ever become Western-trained physicians. Not surprisingly, they graduated at the top of their class. At the graduation ceremony held in University Hall, they received their diplomas, proudly dressed in Chinese garments that had been sent from China, special just for this occasion. They both worked for a stint at Chicago-area hospitals, and it was at one of these hospitals where Mary Stone met Dr. Isaac Newton Danforth. He would find great merit in what both Ida and Mary were aspiring to do, bringing Western-style medical care to women in their part of China. He would go on to make a sizable donation to build a 95-bed, 15-room hospital in Jiujiang where they could carry out their work. In September 1896, Gertrude and her girls were back in Zhejiang, and already, at the age of 22, Ida and Mary both began doing great things. They had arrived back home to great fanfare for what they had achieved at Michigan, 
It wasn't every day where you saw two local Zhejiang women receiving a medical degree with honors from an American university. Not then, anyway. And this being a time in China where talk of reform and modernizing was in the air, where they were held up as role models for the country. Upon their return, Ida and Mary were now officially part of the Women's Foreign Missionary Society, same as their mother, Gertrude Howe. They lived in a modest, Chinese-style home outside the missionary community. Gertrude could have lived with her fellow missionaries, but, you know, because of the way things were, having Chinese children, they had excluded them from living amongst their colleagues. Just one of those things. By 1897, they were both working tirelessly at their mission. Ida and Mary took the idea of self-sacrifice to a new level, and it didn't take long before they were as good or better at what they did than any of their colleagues at the WFMS. And coming from their unique background and having a foot in both worlds, it irked them that they weren't treated as equals, as respected and admired as they may have been. Within the Chinese community in Zhejiang, they received no small amount of praise and were treated by many as accomplished scholars, and their fame amongst the Chinese in Jiangxi began to spread. Municipal and provincial officials loved them. If you recall, in 1895, China suffered a major drubbing at the hands of the newly militant Japan, and following this humiliating defeat, the reform movement began to gain some traction. The reformers and intellectuals in China, once they heard of what Ida and Mary were doing down in Zhejiang, took a great amount of interest in them. And starting in 1897, the two 24-year-old women were more and more held up as role models of the so-called new women in Chinese society. Ida received national prominence from an essay written by none other than Liang Qichao. In this piece, read nationally, he lionized her and held Ida up as a shining example of China's new women. Her embrace of Christianity was played down because eh, this was still a controversial matter in China. Not everyone among the intellectuals thought Christianity was such a good thing for China. To many, it went hand in hand with the imperialism that was so despised. But this essay really gave the work Ida and Mary were doing a lot of exposure and gave hope to some women who aspired to be like them. Other reformers openly praised Ida and Mary for the example they were setting for other women and for the country in general. They spent their days serving the Zhejiang community by treating women in all kinds of ways— treating them at their hospital and going to the homes and to the outlying villages to bring this modern Western medicine to those in need. Fees paid for services were based on patients' ability to pay. If they were poor women whose families had nothing, they paid nothing. The lucrative part of their practice involved treating the rich taitais of the local gentry. They were more open-minded to receiving Western medical treatment and paid the highest fees because... They could afford it. From the day they arrived back in China after receiving their degrees from Michigan until their dying days, both women, Ida Khan and Mary Stone, had to contend with the whole matter of fundraising. They had to constantly seek money from local benefactors in Jiangxi as well as from American sources in order to keep their hospitals, schools, and orphanages running. Anyone who sat through Steven Soderbergh's miniseries, The Nick, would know early 20th century hospitals in America were quite primitive by today's standards. And they were even worse in China. Poor sanitation and hygiene was such that just walking into one of these hospitals was potentially hazardous to one's health. The Western concept of hygiene was something both women introduced and championed throughout their career. This wasn't the sexiest thing, but dealing with germs and maintaining an antiseptic environment probably saved more lives than anything else. The whole idea of germ theory it didn't really start until the 1850s with Louis Pasteur and in the 1870s and 80s with Robert Koch and Joseph Lister. And they were the trailblazers. With the generous financial commitment made to them by Dr. Danforth back in Chicago, they were able to begin construction on Danforth Memorial Hospital in Zhejiang, named in honor of his late wife. 
The two young women were very hands-on in the construction of the hospital and wanted it to be as clean, well-run, efficient, and effective as the best hospitals anywhere in the West. Since the relationship with Dr. Danforth was mostly with Mary, sure may you. She was the principal liaison with him and took the lead in building the hospital. It was completed in the year 1900. Not a good time in China. In between her medical practice and seeing patients every day, she also had to oversee the work with all the contractors. When the hospital was completed, it was state-of-the-art and a massive boon for the prestige of the WFMS, as well as the city of Zhejiang and the province of Jiangxi. But before the ribbon-cutting ceremony could be carried out, both women and many other foreigners as well had to flee China because of the Boxer Uprising. The boiling pot of anti-foreign feelings and emotions overflowed in that year, and many foreigners, including missionaries, were assaulted and killed by the boxers and those sympathetic towards them. Ida and Mary fled to Japan until it was safe to come back. Most of the popular history of the boxers took place in the north of China and concerned the exploits of the Eight Nation Alliance, but the murder and mayhem was carried out elsewhere in the country, including in Jiangxi province, and again, being medical missionaries and all, Ida and Mary had to lay low until this passed in August 1900. In 1901, Danforth Memorial Hospital officially opened. They were able to enjoy some wind in their sails with respect to the government showing all kinds of eagerness to please the foreigners and allow for Western ideas and ways to proliferate. Ida and Mary fully embraced the notion of women helping women. From the ground up, they poured all their energies into creating an army of Christian Chinese women who would take these Christian values and help lift up other women and create a kind of mini-revolution in health care for women in China. Besides the hospital and the services it could provide to those in need, the other main thing they got behind was training women to become nurses. Mary Stone and Ida Khan began personally training nurses and building this new profession from the ground up. They started from scratch training Chinese women to become nurses who could perform to the same standard that could be found in any American hospital. This was a lot harder than you might think. The idea of introducing Western-style health care to the women of a city like Zhejiang. Despite its renown, Danforth Hospital was oftentimes the choice of last resort for many women, after all else failed. This included Chinese traditional medicine, quacks, and all manners of faux healers who overpromised and underdelivered. But in these early years of the 20th century, with so much talk of reform and democracy and science in the air, it was easier to attract patients than before. It was during this time that a new Chinese word was created for nurses, hu shi. It means one who protects or guards. Throughout their careers, Ida and Mary did everything they could to introduce and grow this profession and to attract good Christian Chinese women to this life. At first, the primary focus in training their nurses was on obstetric medicine. She and her nurses delivered a lot of babies. Back then, as many of you probably know, when a woman delivered a baby, she really put her life on the line. Aspects of childbirth that we take for granted today weren't all that well known back in the early 20th century. There was about a 3% infant mortality rate in China, something you might find today in countries like Uganda or Bangladesh. Treating pregnant women and offering well-baby care was a smashing success, and this helped gain her institution some esteem in the eyes of the masses. They were a big step up from the many midwives who were limited in their skill set when the delivery of the baby didn't exactly go according to the book. So Ida and Mary, in taking the lead to train Chinese women to become nurses, they empowered them in ways that midwifery never could. They were pioneering the start of a whole new profession in China. Today, there's something like five million nurses in China, not all of them women. 
And most probably don't know it, but their profession traced its roots all the way back to Kangcheng and Shi Meiyu and their early efforts in Jiangxi province during the early 1900s. Other aspects of health care for women spearheaded by Mary Stone and Ida Khan involved abdominal tumors and ovarian cysts, common maladies that always went untreated. At Danforth Hospital, they trained their nurses while also carrying out surgical procedures. In 1903, Mary and Ida went their own separate ways, with Ida and Gertrude moving down to the Jiangxi provincial capital of Nanchang. Now I'll get to that in a minute. I want to say again that Ida and Mary, while only in their mid-30s, wore most all of the hats at their respective hospitals. Chief of surgery, training nurses, seeing patients administering the hospital, teaching the Bible, and always, always fundraising, trying to get donors in Jiangxi province or the Methodist Episcopal Church or in the USA to cough up money to support their work. And you probably won't find it surprising that nurses back then were just as underpaid and overworked as today's professionals, taking into consideration the number of lives they saved and the care they provided. Mary was known to, every now and then, take on these hardship cases, girls and young women who came her way, and she trained them in nursing. She was doing a lot to serve the women in Zhejiang and help plan some roots for the future, long after she was gone. But no matter what, dreams and missions this big always required money, and raising money was another full-time job that both she and Ida had to handle. From 1906 to 1908, Mary Stone traveled around the U.S. to not only continue her fundraising efforts, but to get an appendectomy as well. She was a rather high-profile figure, not only in China, but in the American missionary community as well. And to ensure that someone of her high esteem didn't get plowed under when going through formalities at Angel Island, no less a person than the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt had intervened to ensure that she received a hassle-free experience while going through immigration in San Francisco. Other Chinese professionals like Mary, as well as students and diplomats who were exempt from the exclusion laws, nonetheless often got raked over the coals going through immigration. Mary wowed the crowds wherever she spoke, public meeting halls, churches, or private affairs, her fluency in English, able to freely communicate and use all the slang and colloquialisms of the day, just endeared her to the audience. She would dress in her trademark Chinese jacket and American skirt, and she became known as a missionary heroine. It did so much to inspire and create awareness about China to American audiences as well, with many going on to a career in the nursing profession. Back in China in 1909, she had raised enough money to not only build a new wing of the hospital with 100 beds, but also move into a nicer dwelling. Up to then, she lived well below the standard that you'd expect for someone of her station in China. The WFMS didn't do much of anything to help her in this respect, but now she was doing much better. And Mary Stone had as her soulmate and lover another missionary named Jenny Hughes. She was also born in the same year as Mary and Ida, 1873, and she came to China as a WFMS missionary in 1905. Jenny lived with Mary Stone, and together they worked as a team and went on to adopt a number of children, all hardship cases, abandoned at birth or born to poor widows who couldn't afford to raise them, and they stayed together until their death. As for Ida Khan... Kang Chung, as I mentioned, she left Danforth Hospital in 1903 and chose to work in Nanchang, the largest city in the province, though not the most modern or developed. Ida depended greatly on the local gentry to stand behind her to generously support this new women's hospital built with local and WFMS funds. And one of the first things Ida did after the hospital was opened was to set up a nursing school. She was still affiliated with the WFMS, the Women's Foreign Missionary Society, and maintained the same missionary zeal and Christian faith. She lived in a small dwelling within the women's hospital that she worked at in Nanchang with her mother, Gertrude Howe, and one of her sisters. 
Though not as developed as Zhou Jiang, Nanchang had a lot more rich and reform-minded local Chinese, and it was this group who Ida tried to get behind her. She often faced the stigma in the eyes of some in Nanchang due to her Christian faith, but she was still very respected and had a very well-earned reputation as a physician. Some local rich benefactors were eager to support her new hospital and insisted to give the money to her rather than the WFMS. Though they respected Ida for the work she did, some had a real problem with the missionary movement It didn't go in for the religion part of her work. She grew her practice down in Nanchang the hard way, building on small successes, earning people's trust one patient at a time. She, too, depended highly on the income earned from treating the rich tai tais of the local gentry. Just as Mary Stone had Jenny Hughes at her side to assist in her work, Ida stayed close with her mother, Gertrude Howe, who served as her partner in all the medical missionary work she performed. After a Methodist bishop passed through Nanchang and saw how Ida Khan and Gertrude Howe were living, They put up the funds to build them a new housing compound within the hospital grounds. And this home, after it was finished, became a kind of huiguan of sorts, a meeting place where people came to discuss matters of importance or to hold banquets for visiting dignitaries and other events. Whenever there was a need for the Chinese local leaders or officials to discuss matters with the foreign community, Ida's home was where these meetings were always held, and she, with her multicultural background, was the perfect hostess and mediator. Ida and Gertrude toured the United States and Europe from 1908 to 1911. This trip was mostly about fundraising and building awareness of their work in China. They received two more rather sizable donations that gave them enough to build a new Nanchang Women and Children's Hospital. Only in her Mid to late 30s, Ida was a larger-than-life figure who commanded the attention and respect of everyone. She was a real dynamo in all she did. Sun Yat-sen paid a visit to Ida when he came through Nanchang. He was also trained as a doctor and fully appreciated the work she was doing. When Ida returned to Nanchang in 1911, the new hospital was nearly completed. The Wuchang Uprising on October 10, 1911, and the revolution that followed brought chaos to Nanchang. By then, public acceptance of Western medicine had grown immensely and was much more common than it had been in the past. In the cities, at least, traditional Chinese medicine had been relegated to the back seat as the reform-minded government went all out to promote Western medicine. Of course, out in the countryside, people still preferred their old methods. Nanchang grew fast in the immediate years following the revolution, and the development gap between the capital and in Zhejiang had narrowed quite a bit. The number of patients had also steadily risen, regardless of how the city fathers felt about Christianity and Ida's affiliation with the missionary movement. Her success reflected favorably on Nanchang, and for this reason, they offered her a great deal of financial support, and she made them and their city look good. Besides all this work she was doing, Ida also went out of her way to back several women and assist them in getting medical degrees and internships in the United States. At her own nursing school, a lot of the women didn't even have a high school education, so she supplemented the teaching with the Chinese classics, geography, arithmetic, and English, and Ida herself would often serve as an instructor. Though these two sisters were now separated in the road they took, They both remain true to promoting the idea of the Christian Chinese woman playing an important role in building the country's modern development. Whereas the Red Cross was all about tending to the sick and wounded in battle, Ida and Mary's work focused on women helping women in women-run institutions. By the way, Mary Stone helped in the founding of the Red Cross in China. In 1918, Mary had worked with six prominent Chinese Christians to found the Chinese Home Mission Society that sought to help minority people in southwest China, particularly in Yunnan. In that same year, Mary turned over the management of Danforth Hospital to one of her other sisters, who was also a physician. And then, Mary sailed to America with Jenny Hughes. 
When she returned in 1920, 47 years old, she left the Women's Foreign Missionary Society and together with Jenny went on to found the Bethel Mission in Shanghai, the Botali Jiao Hui. They started small but grew this mission into quite a sizable institution. During one of her U.S. trips, Ida went on to receive a master's degree at Northwestern University in English Literature and also studied at Johns Hopkins on a Rockefeller Fellowship. One day, whilst on a tour of China, the University of Michigan regent, Levi Barber, met with Ida and Mary and saw the extent of the work they were doing and what they had gone on to achieve after obtaining their medical degrees from Michigan. So impressed was he that Barber went on to endow a fund that supported any Asian woman who lived in any country between Turkey and Japan to earn advanced degrees at the University of Michigan in modern science, medicine, and math. And these Barber scholarships, still around today, offered recipients free tuition and some walking around money. Beginning in 1914, the Rockefeller Foundation began funding hospitals and schools in China. Peking Union Medical College, established in 1921, was modeled on Johns Hopkins University. Mary's sister, Phoebe, had received her medical degree from Johns Hopkins and returned to China to work. And she, along with Jenny Hughes, would work together with Mary to grow the Bethel Mission in Shanghai. Jenny managed the Bible school, and Mary and Phoebe ran the hospital and nursing school. Often when the women patients were waiting for or receiving medical care, they would also receive religious instruction, listen to Bible stories and sermons. With such big money coming to China from these amply funded American foundations to bring Western medicine to the people there, It put some pressure on what Ida and Mary were trying to do, as they had to keep up with the other teaching hospitals as far as modern equipment and facilities went. No longer were they the ones leading the charge in transforming medical treatment in China. Both women, Shi Mei Yu and Kang Cheng, Mary Stone and Ida Khan, they were determined to swim against the narrative stream that inferred Chinese doctors and nurses weren't as capable of giving the same standard of medical care to a patient as their Western counterparts in China. Ida Khan was always the standard bearer of the slogan, by Chinese women, for Chinese women. She had been tempted more than a few times to give up what she was doing in Nanchang, to move to other medical institutions elsewhere, earn a much bigger salary, but... She had a higher calling beyond making money and delivering medical care to people. Between 1923 and 1928, Mary Stone grew the Bethel Mission's footprint to include a high school, a three-story hospital, a tabernacle that could seat a thousand people, and an orphanage. Foreign missionaries were invited to teach at Bethel, but as far as the management and administration, that was all handled by Chinese for Chinese. In 1922, Mary also became the first president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in China and promoted that organization's mission of social reform. One thing about Bethel, like a lot of missionaries, Mary was big on revivals, these evangelistic awakenings in a church community. Revivals provided all kinds of inspirational entertainment that effected religious awakening in many people who attended them. Together with Jennifer Hughes, Mary created these Bethel bands, as they were known. And these musical groups became a big deal in Shanghai. There were more than one of them. And these Bethel bands played in churches all over eastern China, especially in the treaty port cities. The Bethel Worldwide Evangelical Band became particularly popular, especially in the 1930s. But the main mission was to train Chinese women to become nurses and medical workers who would work in hospitals and go out to the towns and villages and use their training in Western medicine to dispense care to those women and children in need. The Christian warlord, Feng Yuxiang, he once reached out to Shi Mei Yu and tried to obtain her help for his soldiers in need of medical care. In 1927, there was a great amount of pushback against the foreign missionaries that started to get so bad that 
Many found it necessary to leave China for greener pastures elsewhere. After playing second fiddle for so long, Chinese missionaries who were no less enthusiastic to serve their lord than their foreign colleagues tried to assert themselves more and take over the reins of leadership in the movement. Gertrude Howe died of malaria on December 29, 1928. Ida arranged for a Chinese funeral. Gertrude Howe not only served others so selflessly, but raised children who, because of the work they went on to do, made her light shine all the more brighter. Over 1,500 mourners came to pay their respects at the funeral service. In an obituary for her mother, Ida Khan had written that she had no idea of racial hierarchy and was someone devoid of racism. Finally, in 1937, 64-year-old Mary Stone, sure may you, she decided to cash in her chips and leave China. She and Jenny Hughes ended up moving to Pasadena, not too far from where I'm recording this now. From there, they continued to fundraise for the Bethel Mission, which they had left in good hands with their adopted daughters, all war orphans. And after World War II, the Bethel Mission would open up branches in Hong Kong and California. Once Ida left Jiujiang for Nanchang back in 1903, with the exception of short stints in Tianjin and other places, this was where she remained throughout her career and up until the very end. Her work in Jiangxi, even at the best of times, was one filled with endless demands of her time and attention. Her patients, hospital administration, local Nanchang officials, and others from the WFMS all made demands on Ida. And there was always fundraising. That was a chore that had no end. In 1930s, Nanchang, well, Jiangxi province in general, I guess you could say, had started to become a hotbed of communism. Mao Zedong would establish his Jiangxi Fujian Soviet in November 1931. His base would be in Ruijin, only three and a half hours south of Nanchang. So this wasn't helping things either. Earlier in 1927, the WFMS budget got slashed. In these uncertain times, the generosity of the local Jiangxi gentry started drying up too. Then came the Depression, which led to a drop in support from American donors. But Ida was able to keep things going, extending life-saving operations and health care to the women who passed through this hospital was merely a part of Ida's daily workload. Ida Khan passed away in December 1931 at the age of 58 from stomach cancer and other ailments. She was still seeing patients and performing surgery up until the end. Her colleagues and friends convinced her to go to a sanatorium in Shanghai to rest. But by the time she checked herself in, the cancer had already spread throughout her system. The prognosis for survival in 1931 wasn't what it is today in our miraculous times. On her deathbed, her sister Mary sat with her, and they sang hymns that they had learned together as children growing up in Gertrude Howe's household back in Jiujiang in the 1880s. As for Mary Stone, she lived out the rest of her days in Pasadena with Jenny Hughes. Jenny died in 1951, and Mary three years later at the age of 81. After she passed... The Bethel Mission in Shanghai continued to be run by her family until the 1960s when it became the Shanghai People's Ninth Hospital. I know the work they did and their achievements doesn't put them on the same level in Chinese history as Han Wu Di, Empress Wu, or Zhu Yuan Zhang, or Zhou En Lai, but you got to admit it's still a heck of a story from their strict missionary upbringing by an intelligent, educated and strong-willed mother such as Gertrude Howe, being pioneers for women choosing a career in Western medicine, and all they did to launch the nursing profession in China, and blazing the trail for millions of women since their time for careers in nursing and other medical professions, and leading and inspiring by their shining and dignified examples, despite the headwinds they faced throughout their lives. And not only that, doing all they did at a time in China when 
Revolution was happening, warlords were thriving and blocking China's rise, and foreigners were continuing their dominance in so many affairs of the Chinese nation. Despite all that, they died having lived lives filled with value for humankind and for their country. We should consider the many women they personally trained and inspired in their own lifetime through the work they did, and how many of those went on to inspire others in the generations that followed into our day. Sometimes you just need to light the flame, and then there will be others who will keep passing it along. So, Ida Khan and Mary Stone, Kang Chung and Shi Mei Yu, pretty extraordinary people, and I wanted to introduce their lives to you. Well, we ran a little long. Hope no one minds. I'll spare you the bit where I ask you for your generous support for my efforts. Once again, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from beautiful Los Angeles, California on a hot August night. Wishing you all the very best, and I hope you'll consider coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.